episode five and episode six of The Last Dance. We are combining all of these things together here in episode six of The Last Dance. The focus was the life in the spotlight of Michael Jordan, right? Laying back and watching TV all day from his hotel suites on the road, trapped in his mansion in the Chicagoland area by celebrity and all that, under immense pressure. To be on all the time, every time he went out in public as the most famous athlete in the world in the peak of his career there with the Chicago Bulls. And they focused a lot on this in the second hour of the documentary that was aired on Sunday night. And they, they said that this is not one of those lifestyles that you envy where you're confined to this room. That was actually Jordan who said that. Jordan said that he was ready for getting out of this life. This was in 1998. You know, when you get to the point, Jordan said, I'm there with no reservations at all. Close quote. Uh, That was the theme for a big chunk of this part of the Last Dance documentary. Jordan says, I don't think you can see the true Michael Jordan for just one day. You have to be Jordan for a week to understand what it's really about. So let us discuss The question, do you have any empathy for Michael Jordan and his celebrity? Now, obviously, this was recorded at the very peak of his superpowers with the Chicago Bulls back in 1998. Uh, But nevertheless, it it hadn't been seen before last night. So do you have any empathy? I do not. Uh, I've got the tennis player, the double-edged sword, and Don King. And we will combine all these things together. Strike up the chorus. Number one. Number one. That's right. All right. So this is the life that Michael Jordan worked his ass off to achieve. And to his credit, he was able to get where many people, I think most guys and probably women too. I don't know. I'm not checked. But most people, when they pick up a, a basketball or any kind of athletic endeavor, you imagine, hey, I am going to be the person that takes the game-winning shot. I'm going to be the hero. I'm going to be like Mike, for example. Anybody that is of the age that when Jordan was on top of the mountain is like, hey, I'm going to be just like Michael Jordan. And you wanted to be at that level. Jordan was trying to get to the level, and he was chasing the contemporaries when he got into the NBA, Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. And he was trying to get to that level. And this is a stark reminder, be careful what you ask for, right? Be careful what you ask for. Jordan went turbo time. We know he zoomed past Magic and Bird on the all-time list. He became the first team sport athlete to be treated as an individual. That was another interesting part of this documentary. If you saw it, you know what I'm talking about. If not, I'll tell you. I'll give you the condensed version. They had a stat about how dominant Michael Jordan was when he signed on the dotted line at Nike, which is stunning. So much so, I wrote down a little note here because I wanted to bring it up. I was like, wow, that's crazy. David Falk, the agent who has been riding the coattails of Michael Jordan, living off the Jordan empire all this time, and he said his vision at his agency, and they had done this, they had a lot of tennis players and whatnot, but David Falk said that his the vision was to turn Michael Jordan into a tennis player, right? A.K.A. at that time, Arthur Ashe, the late, great Arthur Ashe now, but Arthur Ashe uh, was somebody that sold tennis rackets and he had endorsements and whatnot. And so and at that time, nobody in team sports had been sold like that. You had guys that sold shoes and stuff, but it was, uh, in fact, they played one of the commercials here. You had Bird and Magic Johnson who were selling Converse, Those were the top shoes for basketball. Now, they also highlighted the fact that originally David Falk pitched Michael Jordan to Converse, and they passed. Who goofed? I've got to know. But wait, then Jordan's like, uh, he's an Adidas guy. Jordan, when he was growing up, wanted to, to wear Adidas, and they couldn't make that work. Adidas couldn't figure it out. This is one of the great disasters in business. It's almost like when Blockbuster had the chance to buy Netflix. <laughs> Remember that story? Like, Blockbuster didn't take Netflix seriously, and they're like, ah, you know, we'll, we'll be all right. And, uh, yeah, go try to find a Blockbuster video right now. And they could have they could have been Netflix if they had just purchased Netflix, uh, but they didn't do it. Anyway, so back to Jordan here. 
And Jordan wanted Adidas, as we said. They couldn't make it work. Nike was a track shoe company and was a small-time player in the shoe game. They were not a big-time player when Jordan signed up. And then I love the, the story where Mother Knows Best. They talked about the fact that Jordan was not interested in flying all the way out to Oregon to meet with the Nike people. They didn't want a part of that. What a waste. And his mom, Mother Knows Best, his mom talked him into it. Let's hear it for the moms, right? Talk Jordan into it, flying out to meet with the Nike executives. He ended up getting $250,000, which was a lot of money in endorsements at that particular time, $250,000. And the stat, here's the stat, and I wrote this down, okay, because I didn't want to F this up. So Nike, when they signed Jordan, they hoped if everything went right and if Jordan was good on the court, and that Nike marketed the right way, that they could sell $3 million worth of shoes in the first four years that Jordan had signed with Nike. So $3 million in four years, that was the dream that Nike had. They sold over $126 million worth of shoes in the first year alone. The first year alone, that's mind-boggling. The math on that. And how much credit goes to Spike Lee as well, right? Let's not undersell the fact. You talk about marketing Michael Jordan and selling Michael Jordan and making him cool. He was cool on the court, but the Bulls early in Jordan's career blew. They sucked. They weren't very good. Even when when people talk about Jordan and having that ridiculous game at the Boston Garden against Bird and the Celtics, that Bulls team was, I think, 10 or more games under five hundred when they made the playoffs in the Eastern Conference, and then Jordan went off for the 60-point game against the Celtics. But they were terrible. Uh, And people do not, I know this firsthand, you don't have to be on this side of the microphone to know, people don't follow bad teams. They don't support players on bad teams. They don't. They don't buy jerseys of players. They don't buy shoes of players that are on bad teams. But Jordan, he was so amazing individually that he was able to break through that fourth wall, if you will, when it comes to this kind of stuff. And the but Spike Lee, let's not sell him short here. Those commercials that really helped cross over Michael Jordan and helped create the monster of the Jordan Empire. And the marketing side was big, but Jordan took care of ninety eight percent of things on the court. All right, so what else? The second point here. Let's go back to Michael Jordan being worn out of the spotlight, which was a focus of this documentary. Uh, It was a major focus of episode six of The Last Dance. Jordan was called out for also not taking political stance. Uh, This became a central part of the documentaries. Jordan was criticized for saying that Republicans buy sneakers, too. It's a quote that Jordan's become known for over the years and has often brought up. We've brought it up before on the show Uh, Jordan claims that he made the comment in jest on the back of the Bulls bus and it got picked up and it has lived on all these years later, clearly had legs. It was a quote that resonated with a number of people. Uh, And then the other part, which Jordan had a couple of quotes here that stood out. One of them was, I never thought of myself as an activist. I thought of myself as a basketball player. And I love that quote. I love that quote. Now, for, for many, and obviously I'm in this camp as well, that was a breath of, fle- of, of fresh air. That was a breath of fresh air that Michael Jordan said, hey, I'm not an activist, I'm a basketball player. And you contrast that with LeBron James, who is more of an activist than he is a basketball player half the time, right? LeBron, he would be much more liked if he didn't spend so much time working with the other stuff, trying to be the most woke guy in the NBA, right, the social justice warrior LeBron James, dipping his toes into the political water, and the water of politics is filled with piranhas. LeBron Uh, James. More now than ever. Uh, But Jordan was like, I don't want any part of that. It's like, hey, I'm not, you know, his mom tried to get him to endorse, I forget the guy's name, but he was running for Congress out of North Carolina, and Jordan's like, I don't know this guy. I'm not just going to blindly do a PSA for this guy, which I respect. And then Jordan's like, hey, I'll send money in. And he sent money in, and then uh, he got just ripped for it. Just got absolutely ripped apart for it. Um, as far as the isolation of Jordan being trapped in his own celebrity bubble, being the most famous person on the planet, I would say, for 
a period of time, most recognizable person on the planet because of the Nike advertising and all that, it is fair to say that that is a double-edged sword, right? You get all the trimmings that come with that, the money, the power, the fame, the uh, women, Shout out to the ladies and all the extras and all the, you know, the lavish lifestyle. You can buy whatever you want and all that. But then you also get the separation from normalcy. I mentioned this as well, but Michael Jordan was living the quarantine lifestyle, which is now in vogue and many of us are living right now here in 2020 back in the 90s. And he was ahead of his time. He was an innovator, Michael Jordan. As far as not being able to go out and all that, and it, they, they showed him the, the shot of him getting off the elevator at some five-star hotel was, uh, was crazy. The crowd goes wild as soon as the elevator doors open and Jordan walks out, and uh, that, was, that was crazy. You know, but Jordan, when he traveled around, they, they usually the Bulls would stay at like the Ritz-Carlton or a Ritz-Carlton-type hotel on the road, and Jordan would get like the top floor of the hotel to himself. I know this because I have people that are in the inside on that. And I know I, I was actually in uh, the Phoenix uh, Ritz-Carlton in the very top floor. There's like three or four rooms or something like that. And you got to have a special access card to get up there. And that's where the, the top political figures and all that when they go to Phoenix stay. But th- that was like every city was like that. All right, final point. All right, so it was the great boxing promoter, Don King, who preached years ago about life in the spotlight. And it still rings true today. It's one of the greatest quotes Don King ever had. He said, you are scrutinized, despised, politicized, dramatized, chastised, analyzed, moralized, stigmatized, sensationalized, and criticized when you're in the spotlight. (laughs) And, of course, I didn't do that quote justice because Don King just had this rhythmic rat-a-tat-tat when he gave that quote. And uh, and it was great. Uh, But it goes with the real estate, right? It goes with the real estate. Another one of my favorite quotes that regards that part of celebrity is the famous quote from the early days of Hollywood. When Hollywood went from radio, the radio star was the big star, and then they went to to movies and to television shows, and it crossed over from radio to television. And the quote goes something like this. I'm going to paraphrase it. But a celebrity works hard for years to become famous and then wears dark glasses to avoid being recognized. And that's essentially true here like Jordan's like he wanted to be on top of the mountain he got to the top and then it became overwhelming and you know, Jordan had a quote about being a role model which also uh, resonated it was like a version of a Charles Barkley quote I bet you Jordan's jealous of Barkley that Barkley's been able to just say some stuff that Jordan never was able to say but Jordan said it's never going to be enough for everybody He said, talking about being a a role model back in the day, he said, because everybody has a preconceived idea in terms of what I, Jordan said, I should do and shouldn't do. The way I go about my life is I set examples, Jordan said, and if it inspires you, great, I will continue to do that. If it doesn't, then maybe I'm not the person you should be following. 